time. What we propose is a new way of looking at addictions, a new formulation, a new interpretation, a new model for addictions. Going back to the old days, addiction was thought of as a disease of spirituality. And thus, the 12-step program and the spiritual approach and the higher power. The disease concept came in to uh, basically give the addict a chance at dealing with his problem without the, the uh, dispersions that he's uh, some sort of inferior being, so he was told that he has a disease. But it was a spiritual disease to start out with. This is not how we see it, even though the 12-step program is throughout the treatment centers uh, throughout the country and is still the primary modality for treating addictions, at least in the psychotherapy dimension. Our model, however, uh, coincides with the disease model but the disease is a very different one. The disease starts in two phases. The first phase is a post-traumatic stress disorder. Virtually everyone we've seen with opiate addiction has had a significant early life trauma. They have, as a sequelae of that, they have panic attacks 85 to 90 percent and rage attacks up to 40 percent. A number of them are clinically depressed maybe 15% will need antidepressants and a generalized anxiety disorder, which is probably 85% of patients. So what does this translate to? The PTSD has a host of symptoms that follow the individual throughout life. He self-medicates with opiates to deal with that problem, becomes addicted, and then comes in for treatment needs to be seen in the complexity of his problem. So we've got the PTSD, which has to be dealt with, uh, psychotherapy, CBT, or whatever it means uh, there is. And uh, the anxiety disorder, panic disorder, uh, depression have to be treated as they would under other circumstances. It's, it's a dual diagnosis. But what we want to look at is a receptor disease. That's how we want to see things. Depression is known to be a depletion of activity of serotonin. Uh, they say that the receptor is down-regulated. That's the term. But it just means that the receptor is not working properly. And the antidepressant receptor that's basically damaged is getting more serotonin. And more activity and therefore less depression. Bottom line, depression is a receptor disease of the serotonin receptor. Now we look at other receptors and we must because they are also affected. The anxiety component is a GABA receptor dysfunction. So now that's the second receptor and it has to be identified and worked with. That usually means benzodiazepines, but currently standard of care does not permit treatment with, with benzodiazepines normally, which has the clinician basically ignore the dysfunction of the GABA receptor by the political decisions of the people that uh, write the manuals. So we have an okay with the serotonin dysfunction correction, but not an okay with the GABA dysfunction correction. Let's move on. There's another receptor involved, which is the mu receptor. That's the receptor that the opiate attaches to. And the addict craves for substances that will attach to the mu receptor. So he may be given methadone, which will attach to that receptor, lower cravings, prevent symptoms of withdrawal. Or suboxone, which uh, has a unique property of attaching to the mu receptor, but more suboxone does not create more effect on the mu receptor. There's a, what they call a ceiling effect. So you can't really abuse the suboxone because you can add more, but you don't get an increased effect. That's unique. And suboxone also has a blocker just to ensure the fact that more suboxone does not give you more effect the blocker 
also blocks the action on the mu receptor. So Suboxone turns out to be one of the best treatments for addictive disease because it's got this property where more is not better, more is just the same and the addict can't get an, an increased effect by just adding more drug. Therefore his addiction is pulled under control and uh, the, the addiction is handled. So that talks about three receptors. Now there's 150 receptors involved in the brain that are known today and we really don't have a picture of which receptors have to be fixed in order to get the afflicted person fixed. But it's known that a glycine receptor uh, is also apparently uh, damaged because medications that repair that uh, glycine receptor are effective in treating rage attacks and somewhat with panic attacks. So we've got now a fourth receptor that we're looking at in terms of dealing with addictions. Uh, dopamine's yet another receptor it has a direct link to the use of cocaine, nicotine, and carbohydrates, uh, uh, sugars, and uh, dopamine medications, which would be Abilify, uh, are known to help with uh, the depression. So the depression, which we understand as a serotonin problem, uh, is uh, augmented by Abilify, which is a D2 or dopamine medication. So the dopamine plus the serotonin, those two receptors have a, a very beneficial effect for depressed patients and also a beneficial effect for patients who are addicted to cocaine because cocaine goes to the, the D2 or dopamine receptor but is blocked if the patient's taking Abilify and he gets no lift out of the cocaine and eventually is dissuaded from his addiction to cocaine. So you can use Abilify to treat the cocaine addiction. It also treats, as I said before, the depression that goes along with the addiction. So we've got five receptors that we're looking at. Most or all of them are basically diseased in the addiction, addiction problem. Uh, those broken receptors have to do with Number one, the PTSD, the, pre the depression, panic attacks, and rage attacks that we see, uh, as well as the anxiety, that is the reflection of the broken receptor and the PTSD. So in treating the P PTSD, we're treating broken receptors, and we have to go on and look at the receptor disease that is part of the PTSD. Now for a physician to be told that you you can treat someone with a, a problem with addiction and facilitate activity on the serotonin receptor with an antidepressant and that's fine but you can't do anything to help him with the damaged GABA receptor because that involves a benzodiazepine which has a bad reputation so the GABA receptor has to go untreated this is a defect in our thinking process and this uh, receptor disease concept has to address that we're treating broken receptors and we can't just say we don't like to treat these receptors but we will treat these other receptors uh, it's a fallacious argument and it has to be looked at and re-examined but the state of the art today uh, will have you in some jeopardy as the treating physician if you're treating on the GABA receptor with benzodiazepines. That's just the state, state of the situation today. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding. That's why we want to present this model, the dual model, which is PTSD plus receptor disease, as the entity which is in back of the addiction. That's basically the sum and total of the theory. But just to throw in one other very interesting uh, effect that we are now looking at has to do with oxytocin. Oxytocin is 
the hormone that's released during a childbirth or at other times associated with people bonding. When the baby is born, the mother looks at the baby, oxytocin is released in the mother and baby, both with the oxytocin in their central nervous system bond. And that's the chemical that creates this bonding or facilitates it. So our question is, if a person has had PTSD, depression, a lot of anxiety, low self-esteem, and is then experiencing a high from an opiate, we suspect that there is now a bonding activity between that opiate state, being high, as it's referred to, and oxytocin, which is bonding. So now that there's a bonding between, between the opiate experience and the patient's sense of well-being, and that is, uh, can be a permanent bonding force. So uh, not, an individual is not involved in this, but oxytocin creates the bonding and the connection between the opiate uh, experience uh, creates a bonding which is a lifelong process in the brain. True, then the receptors that oxytocin attaches to uh, also now have to be discovered in the uh, hypothalamus and other areas where the oxytocin is present and active have, has to be looked at because those are areas that are going to have to be identified and treatments designed to uh, work around. So that's basically it in a nutshell. It's a new model. We've got to start thinking in terms of things that work, not things that aren't working. Uh, the statistics on AA meetings is that only 5% of people are still showing up after a year, which according to a statistical analysis, anything registering at 5% effectiveness is indeterminate as having any effect whatsoever. So a, a statistician would argue at 5% uh, effectiveness of AA, it can't, it does not indicate that AA has any effect at all. Placebo effect, however, uh, scores higher than 5%, sometimes 15, 20% uh, around antidepressants and other interventions. So this idea of the spiritual disease of addictions is really out of date and uh, new models have to be added. We're proposing this one as a start and, and there are going to be uh, other models to follow, other ideas to follow, but we really have to uh, clean up, start looking at the problem and start treating the problem the best way we can because we have a lot of patients, maybe a million out there with opiate problems and if we're not treating them because we're thinking the wrong way and not doing the right thing, then we really have to stop in our tracks and review what we're doing. And thanks for listening.